Let's pray, then we'll we'll move on. Lord, we we want to acknowledge that you are with us here tonight and that you are Lord of all, and we are not. And so we ask for your will to be done. We ask, Lord, that you would have your way in our lives and in all the circumstances that we've mentioned here tonight. And Lord, all over this building... And all across our property, there are people of all ages meeting to fellowship and to sing and to study your word and to eat. And we are so thankful for being able to do all of the things that we do. And so I pray that you'd bless all the volunteers who are leading tonight, various Bible studies and activities, that you would provide what they need to do what you've called them to do. And Lord, I'm thankful for all of the students of all ages, adults down to infants, who are here to experience the love of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them tonight. And Lord, we, uh, we release to you these names on this list, on this prayer list, that in those that we've mentioned tonight, in those things that have gone unmentioned, we release all of these to you. Because you are trustworthy and good. And we pray, Lord, for uh, Bob and Vesta Willie, that you would bless them. And uh, help them to know that you are very near to them. And we do commend them to your care, Lord. May your will be done. We pray for Diana Thomas, that you would heal her hip and renew BJ's strength as he does what he needs to do to care for her. And Lord, we pray for Jeff and Laura Lanningham that you would bless Jeff, that you would heal his brain, help him to uh, recover what seems to be slow and coming back right now. Help us to celebrate the good things you've done already for them. And uh, there is so much for which to be thankful, and we are thankful. I ask God that you would renew Laura's strength tonight and with the, the rising of the sun each day, help her to rise and walk with you as she does the things that you've placed in front of her to care for her husband and her family uh, every day. Uh, May your will be done. Lord, speak to us tonight as we open your word. It is a privilege to receive your word, to hear it, to study it, to ponder it, and to seek how it can transform our lives. And so, Lord, speak to us tonight. And we love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are in Titus chapter 2. We are moving right along. I've noticed as a pastor, as I've advanced in age, I've slowed down. Uh, So it's taking me longer to work through things. But uh, I teach uh, a class, I usually teach one class a semester for Stark College and Seminary. My students there complain about how fast I go. (laughs) Uh, And it's just not, uh, they just need to grow up, right? (laughs) Uh, We move along. But here we move rather slowly. All right, so tonight we're going to start in Titus chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 11, and Paul has been giving some ethical Uh, instructions to Titus that he's to teach to the churches there on Crete how the different groups are to act and to behave and tonight he's going to provide some theological basis for that for those instructions and to help connect the dots between uh, what they believe what Jesus has done for them and then how they are to act towards others towards one another So let's look at the text. Titus chapter 2, I'll start in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people who are his very own, 
eager to do what is good. Uh, these then are the things you are to teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. All right. So, first off, let's think about what is theology? How would you define it? Don't use the word boring. I'll be disappointed. The study of religion. All right, the study of religion. How else? Someone else. What is theology? Okay, going deep into the things that Scripture says to us. Of course, all of that is true. In general, theology uh, is just the study of God, who He is, His character, and His actions on behalf of humanity as recorded for us in Holy Scripture. And so, in general, you and I know God through two ways. Uh, one is through our experience. And I hope that you've had an experience, a real supernatural experience in which you've met the risen Lord Jesus Christ, where the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, has taught you, has changed you. You have felt things. You have learned things. You've had that experience where the hair has stood up on the back of your neck and on your arms, where the light bulb has gone on, boom, and suddenly something has made sense, where the Lord has provided, uh, you name it. We experience things, and that's one way we come to know the Lord. The other way, and the, probably the most important way we come to know the Lord, is through Scripture. And all of our experiences are interpreted in light of what God's Word tells us about who God is, and what He's already done uh, in the history of His people, to understand who Jesus is and what He's done uh, for us. Uh, and so... Both of, those, both of those ways of coming to know the Lord are, are important, and I don't think you can separate them, but really it's, it's Scripture, and, and understanding Scripture and going deep in Scripture and applying that to our lives that helps us to interpret the reality of what we experience day in and day out. So both are important. Uh, I want to learn to, how do I want to call it, to do the art of theological reflection. I want to learn to view my reality through the lens of what Scripture says about God and His ways and how He's worked in human history. And so I'm always trying to be a, a, a good theologian. You're a theologian. You realize that? You have to also uh, ponder the deep things of God that you find in Scripture. It's your job to mine Scripture to get to the heart of things and to go deep and to ponder deeply and over a long period of time and allow God's Word to shape your life and to shape how you view your experiences and your relationships. and uh, Everything in our world should be viewed through the lens of uh, what God's Word tells us. And so uh, that's a theological activity. That's theological reflection. And it's something that we are all supposed to do you are a theologian and you didn't even note it. I gave you all a promotion tonight. Um, as a pastor, one of the things I'm supposed to do is to be a public theologian. And so on behalf of the church, uh, I often interpret reality. This is what I see uh, based on God's Word and what I'm seeing in my life and the lives of others. I help people to connect the dots and to uh, see through the lens of Scripture and uh, I can do that in the community. I did a lot of that when we endured Hurricane Harvey. I tried to, people to, to get people to lift their eyes and to see larger realities at work, to have hope on that. And so I'm a public theologian. That's true. Uh, there are people who want to be public theologians, and I wish they would be quiet. <laughs> but uh, as Baptists, we affirm that every person, we call it soul competency. Every person is competent to go to the, the Word of God and read it for themselves and let the Spirit speak to them. And each person is competent to go directly to God and pray directly to God, confess their sins directly to God, to hear from the Lord, to respond directly to the Lord without a priest being an intermediary. And 
And so uh, uh, I forgot what the point of all of that was, but uh, let's move on. So when we study Scripture, whether it's Bible study or we're doing a discipline theological study, for instance, there's a point to it all. We want to know Lord, the Lord more, and then we want to become more like Jesus. And so, uh, there is a sense in which the study of Scripture, and especially the study of theology, is an academic exercise. But that's not all it is. And so, even in seminary, when we study things and we're tested on things, it is, uh, it's supposed to shape our lives. And this is one of the things that Paul is trying to bring out to Titus. Uh, It's one thing to have knowledge of the word of the Lord, but that knowledge of God and his word and his ways is to shape the way that we live our lives. It's to produce something. It's to result in something. So it's not just an academic exercise. Your discipleship is not a classroom experience. Uh, It's meant to be transformative changes our lives, changes the way we relate to the Lord, to relate to one another, uh, to relate especially to those people, you know, uh, who really get your, your goat. Or What does that even mean, get your goat? We'll talk about that another time. But Paul is very concerned that what we believe has direct impact on the lives that we live. So if you look at verse 11... He brings up immediately the subject of grace. So what does verse 11 tell us about the nature of God's grace? All right. One thing he says for sure is that it brings salvation. What else does it tell us? All right. To everyone, to all men. Uh, What is grace? Okay, a pardon for sure. How else? What else? What is grace? Unmerited favor. favor. Of course, you've been taught well. All right, it's a gift. So, um, it is God's beneficial activity on behalf of us corporately and individually. He's done something for us as an act of grace. He's done something for you and for me as an act of grace. Uh, God's grace toward us is based on what? Jesus? Yeah. So, what is it not based on? Right. So, God's grace toward us is based solely on His love for us. It's based on what Jesus has done for us. And it's based on our total inability to do anything for ourselves. Uh, it's a uh, oh my gosh my brain is just uh, Jonathan Edwards oh my gosh Jonathan Edwards said that you and I contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin that makes it necessary and so that's grace grace is a gift that we do not deserve and cannot earn. And without God's grace, there can be no salvation because grace is foundational to salvation because of what Jesus has done for us. And so, in, in the text, the word for... the word that describes salvation is modifying the, it's the grace of God. And so, salvation first and last, through and through, from beginning to end, if we are saved from our sin, it's because of grace. Period. Uh, This is a very strong emphasis that Paul is making here. Uh, We we don't earn it or contribute to it. It's all a gift. First, uh, through and through. It's all grace. So, he's got an interesting phrase there that the salvation has appeared to all men. So how do we understand that phrase? Do what? It's available. it's available to all men. Interesting. 
How else do you understand it? Who are the all men? Who are they? Everybody? Is it just men? People? Okay. All right. So uh, it's an interesting, just something to think about. Um, as Baptists, what we're going to say is that the salvation is universally offered to all people without exception. Everybody has the opportunity to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and be saved from their sin. Uh, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, uh, and so I don't think Paul is saying all people are already saved. He's not a universalist in that sense, but he's just saying that what Christ did, He did for all of us, and so all people have the opportunity to come to saving faith in Christ. Um, because of my Baptist tradition and, and the flavor of Baptist life in which I was raised, I lean more towards that way. If you grew up in a church that was more, uh, where the, the pastor had more of a Reformed theology, you might have been taught that uh, Jesus died only for the elect. And uh, that's an okay way of looking at it, I just think it's wrong. <laughs> and so I believe, you know, that Jesus died for all people, and all people can come to saving faith in Christ, even though not everyone will. A Reformed theology tends to teach that Jesus died only for the elect, and that's just, well, it's, it's not what I believe. Um, something else that Paul says is that God's salvation appeared at a given time in history. When was that? Well, at the death and resurrection, but you could say even just the coming of Christ in general. That's when God's salvation appeared. Everything before that in the history of Israel looked forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, His death and His resurrection. And as Christians now, we look back on that, the death and resurrection of Christ as being the foundational thing that makes us Christians. And we turn our eyes forward to what? Yeah, the second coming of Christ at the, uh, the end of the age. So in between uh, the time in which Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection to the time that Jesus returns at the end of the age, God's grace is at work in our lives. Now I assume that uh, you sin every now and then. Right? Some of you less than others. I know. And so, I, I'll just speak for myself, I am not sinless or perfect. Uh, now the Bible says I will be one day when Jesus returns at the end of the age. But for now, my, the practical reality is that uh, I'm still a sinner. The good news is that God's grace gives to me Christ's sinlessness so that that's what God sees when He looks at me. He gives to me the righteousness that is Christ alone. I don't deserve that. He just gives it to me. And so one day, when Jesus returns, I'm going to be made, in fact, what I am now by faith. I'm righteous by faith. Uh, one day I'll be righteous in reality. I'm on my way. Till then, grace operates in my life. All is grace. Grace sustains us in our time of need. Grace provides our, our strength. It provides thanksgiving and glory to God. It affects our conversations. It enables believers to live holy and godly lives. I can't say enough about God's grace. All right. In verse 12, in what ways does God's grace teach us to live differently. Okay. And then to do... Okay. Yeah. It says... Well, I can't see that at all. That's better. Teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and instead to live. And Paul has this list of things... And the first on that list is our favorite word, self-controlled, which 
Paul has emphasized time and time again in the book of Titus. All right, so uh, Paul understood that because God's grace was at work in our lives, that it would change us and change churches to be these uh, supernatural communities of faith that became more like Christ and looked less and less like any other worldly organization. And so here he says that God's grace teaches us. It's a continuous action. It keeps on teaching us to say no. And the language that Paul uses here is pretty strong that it can have the idea that grace teaches us in, in the way of educating us, but probably a better English translation is the idea of discipline or chastisement. Did uh, your parents or some authority figure ever discipline you? How old were you when you began to see that as an act of grace? Today? <laughs> not yet. We're not there yet. But you think about it, my parents, who were not perfect, but did quite a bit for me, they could have let me just go and do whatever I wanted, but they loved me too much to do that. And even though I uh, was not worthy of uh, much of what they did for me, they did it anyway, even correcting me as an act of love. And the book of Hebrews especially picks up on this idea that God corrects us because he loves us, and that's grace. He doesn't allow us to wander off on our own and to pursue sin. He chastises us. He disciplines us as an act of His love, as an act of grace, so that we might, uh, as you've said, to live better, to make some better choices. Um, so we are to, to participate in God's grace. I've been talking about this on Sunday mornings, that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the German martyr, martyr really helps us to understand what this means, participative grace. I participate in God's grace as I do God's Word. Uh, my faith in Christ leads to obedience. I have the grace to believe, the grace to obey. When I fall short of God's Word, I fall on God's grace. As I participate in God's grace, as I do God's Word, my character, my relationships, my circumstances are all changed. So it all comes down to grace in my life and how I respond to that grace, how I participate in God's grace by receiving and doing His Word. All right. He talks about uh, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Uh, how does that align with the idea of living under God's grace? Saying no. How does that connect with the idea of living under God's grace? Okay. That's right. That's right. So let me teach you one of the most powerful words you can learn and uh this, this word probably needs to be used more often in our lives, and uh, it, it, it is, uh, it's very free. And so I want you to repeat after me, okay? No. You have to say it from your diaphragm. You have to really mean it. No. Yeah. No. It's powerful. Powerful, powerful. powerful word. There's a boundary. No. And beyond that, it's, it's a no for me, dog. You know, I'm not, it's, it's, that's not right. And this is what Paul is saying, that God's grace allows us to see and understand where that line is. Where, where do we start to say no? And then to actually have the courage and the guts to say it, to mean it, to live it out. I'm not going to live that way. And there's all kinds of things that come up during the day that uh, requires us to make choices. And Paul is saying that it's God's grace that helps us to know how to say no, when to say no, 
and to mean it, you know, to live that out. There must be a conscious, willful repudiation of thoughts and words and actions that are opposed to the Lord, His Word, and His ways. Must just reject all of that for myself and to help others to reject it for themselves as well. There are some things that are right, some things that are wrong. There are things we say yes to, and there are other things we say we say no to. Uh, anything that has connected to uh, anything that is connected to the worldly system, which is hostile to the Lord, needs to be treated uh, respectfully and kept in its proper place, and maybe even said no. You know, there comes a time we have to say no to those things. Uh, Someone once said that the true learning of heaven must begin with the unlearning and laying off of all which stands in the way of the development of the new man in Christ. Unlearning. Ugh, learning how to say no. All right. So uh, once we say no, what are the ways in which Paul says we are to live? Ugh. Yes? Okay. Aren't you excited about all of that? <laughs> um, so here, we live uh, self-controlled. The idea is sensible. We've talked about it, how it has the idea of sober-minded. You know, I'm serious. I'm taking this seriously. And uh, Paul has used this word before. He talks about living a life that is upright. In other words, it's conduct that cannot be condemned. Uh, I think it, it's, a, it's a word that is to refer to all, just the general course of our lives. At any given moment, we probably fall short and we have conduct that can be condemned, but the overall course of our lives is to be upright. And then... He says we are to live godly lives, which has the idea of being pleasing to God. We live to please God rather than one another or ourselves. Chances are Paul intends for us to use all of these words together to describe uh, the way that we are to live in God's grace in the world. And, he, and specifically, he says we are to live in this present age. You know, to be clear, and Paul is trying to be clear, he expects us to live differently right now from the unbelievers that are all around us. Uh, the, the presence of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, our salvation in Christ, it all matters. It's not just for eternity, it matters for now too. So we are to live this way right now. I know one day when Christ returns, I'll be more self-controlled, you know and there will be no sin, hallelujah. But today, I'm still supposed to walk in God's grace in a self-controlled and upright and godly manner. And when I fall short, again, I, I fall on God's grace. But He does, the Holy Scripture does tell us that the presence of the Lord, the things that Jesus has done for us, does matter, and it changes us. Another interesting thought when Paul refers to this present age, for us to keep in mind is that that's this age. There's still another age to come when Christ returns at the end of all things. Now, we're not there yet. And you are all weary pilgrims Amen. on your way. Yeah, this is not your home. You're just, you're passing through. You're on your way. Uh, but you're going to get there one day. We've talked, I don't know if we did it in here, but when we, you know, it, when we talk about heaven, one of the things we say about heaven is that uh, we know that there will be a Sabbath rest for us when we get there. You'll get to rest. And rest in a way that there's no guilt. You'll, you'll be able to rest the way that your cat does all day long. I mean, just no cares. No concerns, uh, just rest. Won't that be nice? Truly. And uh, we're not there yet. That's the next age. 
in the meantime, you know, there's work to be done. We're still on the road. We're still traveling along. And so, but there is another age to come. All right, verse 13. He refers, he uses that, that phrase, blessed hope. So who is the blessed hope referring to in this verse? All right, to Jesus. So while we are in this present age, Paul stated that Christians wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So this combination of waiting and hoping for complete and realized redemption, both from our sinful nature and uh, from this present evil world, is expressed better maybe in Romans 8, uh, verses 18 through 25. But it, Paul has this, it, it's a blessed hope that we have. It's a, it's a glorious appearing of Christ that will redeem us from our sin and from this sinful world. And we are looking forward to that. So how does the anticipation of Christ's return influence the way we live our lives now? All right. Job one, that's pretty good. Be ready. Encourage others to be ready. Yep. That's right. To be to be found faithful when he comes. What else? Do what? Yes, keep your lamps primed, lit, and ready. Uh, I also... I think there's a sense here in which Paul is giving us permission to give ourselves a break. Uh, you are not perfect yet, you know. And you will be when Christ returns, and we are all longing for that day. But for now, we're, we're, we're living under grace. God gives us grace. We need to give ourselves grace from time to time. And then in Romans 8, you know, he talks about how all creation is groaning under the weight of sin and longing for the return of Christ. Uh, this age, uh, will the sinful age, will come to an end and Christ will make all things new. Uh, one of the challenges we might face in keeping our focus on this hope amidst the busyness and distractions of life? It's just we, get we get busy and distracted. What are things that distract people in our culture that take our take their eyes off Christ? Cell phones. Cell phones. <laughs> Amen. It does. The jobs. Video games. Yeah. The news. Uh, fishing. All of those hobbies, which aren't bad in and of themselves, but they might distract us from living the lives that God created us to live. Maybe. Yeah. All kinds of things. We, there's no end to these things. And Paul has the idea, you know, that as Christians we would be self-controlled enough to be able to say no and to say yes to the things of God. There's an interesting phrase here that Paul really doesn't use that often and it's, and it's just in. Let me find it, the way that he says it. Um, He says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is one of the the only times in which Paul refers to Jesus as God. So it raises an interesting question. uh, How do we know that Jesus is God? He's, okay, his own testimony. Okay, how else do we know? Okay, that's slippery scripture. It covers everything. Anything specifically? Okay, John 1. Okay, so um, we don't need Paul to tell us explicitly that Jesus is God, although I'm glad he did. There are things that in the Gospels and in the New Testament that indicate the deity of Jesus Christ. For instance, 
a supernatural birth or conception, really, when we talk about that. Uh, his sinless life, the way that he fulfilled Old Testament messianic prophecy, uh, the way that he demonstrated authority over nature, disease, demons, and even death itself. And he, Jesus claimed for himself the prerogatives of God, which included forgiving sins and judging sinners, and uh, his resurrection from the dead, and uh, his ascension into heaven is probably the ultimate sign of God's, or, or, or of Jesus' divinity. So, I like that Paul connects Jesus with God here, but we don't rely on just Paul's testimony. Uh, we see it throughout Scripture. Yeah, Linda? Yes, when uh, she's saying his baptism, Father, Son, and Spirit there together. And the Spirit comes down. Yeah. Good, good. All right, verse 14. He tells us that uh, Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all wickedness and every lawless deed. Uh, so, what does that mean? That Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. All right. What what can we learn about what he says there in verse fourteen? What do we learn about the death of Jesus? The verse is loaded with meaning. All right. It, it, it does redeem us. What does he redeem us from? Yes. Yes. All the sin and wickedness that separated us from God. All right. What else does it tell us? It purifies us. So, it, again, there's a sense of we are bought back. Our sin is forgiven. And then going forward, Jesus purifies us. And uh, we would call that sanctification where God works in my life to help me to become more like Christ over the course of my life. That's a process that will be completed when Jesus returns at the end of the age. I'll be completed then. But for now, you wrap the construction tape around my life I'm a work in progress, but I am making progress. I'm not what I was, I'm not what I will be. Right. Okay, so there's that redeem us from all wickedness and purify himself. What else does this tell us about the death of Jesus? What can we learn? All right, so through his death and his resurrection, he claims us as his own when we trust in him. Paul uses adoption language. Uh, we are adopted in to God's family. Uh, orphans out there on our own, separated, but God wants us. So he goes and claims us as his own. Hallelujah. Jesus said there's no greater love than the only God's life for the friend. Yes. Yes. We are friends of God that he would lay down his life. Yes. Claim us as his own. What else? Anything else you see? What do we learn? Okay. Uh, uh, the language is interesting. Uh, has the idea, you know, uh, eager, the, the desire, uh, the longing, the urgency of doing what is good. My wanter is changed when I come to Christ over time, so that uh, I no longer want maybe to pursue and fulfill all of my sinful, self-destructive appetites, which are pretty powerful. Instead, I want to do what is good. Not just for me, but for others as well. That's pretty powerful. I need my wanter fixed. That's not natural. Right. That's supernatural. That God does that for us. There's one more thing in verse 14. It's probably not as obvious, but it's that he gave himself. We can't say enough. Jesus wanted us, that he went to the cross. He did it willingly. He was not forced. He gave himself. So, so good. That ought to give you goosebumps. He wanted to. He wanted to. All right. Yes. Yes. Not my will, but your will be done. Okay. 
talked about redemption. We are bought back. We talked about purification. So, let's look at verse 15. Let me read it again. He says, These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority, and do not let anyone despise you. So, What's the significance of Paul's instruction to Titus to speak, to exhort, and to rebuke with all authority? Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a terseness and a toughness here. And maybe uh, the way that the words are used, that there's even a progression. You teach, you encourage, and then maybe you rebuke. You've done that with your own children, you know. Uh, but Paul may intend degrees of seriousness as they go along that... Uh, you provide faithful instruction in these things, all the things theologically and ethically that Paul has been speaking about up to this point. He wanted Titus to, to point those out. And then uh, he says, you, you encourage, which has you know, the idea of, uh, of, of helping or persistence in the ideas that, that, that Titus is teaching. And then finally, the rebuke, uh, which is a, you know what a rebuke is. Just that strong note to that, drawing the boundary. And then he tells, tells Titus to do it with all authority. Whose authority? All right, so, you know, for Titus, that would have meant Paul's authority, and Paul got his authority from Christ. So what Christ passed on to the apostles and the apostles passed on to that generation that was authoritative. It was the word of the Lord. And they were to use it to teach people, to encourage them and to rebuke them as necessary. And uh, Paul is encouraging Titus to uh, take that role. Take that role. The church needs to be taught and encouraged, and sometimes the church needs to be rebuked. And uh, Titus is the one who had that responsibility to do those things. And then he ends with an interesting, do not let anyone despise you. What does that mean? Disregard. Disregard? That's good. That's a good translation. Discourage. Okay. So, uh, when you are, uh, when you are using the word of the Lord to teach and to encourage and possibly to rebuke, you don't have any control over, uh, people's responses to that. Your job is to be faithful in the task that God has given you. And so what Paul is saying, the language indicates that Titus is to stay the course in that. And as Catherine said, not to be, not to let people disregard you. They're going to brush you off. Or they're going to ignore you. They're going to encourage you to be quiet. You name it. But you stay the course with the word of the Lord. Uh, because that uh, will benefit the church in the long run. Do you think that um, because he was so young, that it was kind of a passing torch and showing him that he would have this great responsibility? And in terms of youth, perhaps people might disregard him or Could be. take him seriously? So we don't really know the age of guys like Titus or Timothy, except that they were probably substantially younger than Paul himself. And when we talked about Timothy, we talked about how uh, Paul was approaching the end of his life, the end of his ministry, and there was definitely a sense of passing on the baton or the torch to the next generation. The same is true here for Titus. And Paul may likely, by the time this letter is written, knows he's never going to return to Crete, and so it's up to Titus to carry on the work of the Lord in those churches that are there. And so, again... Jesus passed these, on to, these things on to the apostles who then passed them on to the, another generation. 
And so by Titus' lifetime, you have second and third generation Christians alive in the church. And uh, it's so important that Paul, as he approaches the end of his life, feels like that he's done what he can to prepare these church members to carry the weight of the, the mission and of the word of the Lord and to pass that on to the next generation. Oh, it could be. Yes, very good. Um, how important is it to balance the qualities of authority and gentleness when we interact with others? Jim says critical, is he right? Yes. Is that critical? How, how good are we at all? You wish we were better? So, um, and I, I think Paul probably struggled with this too, especially if you read his letters to the Corinthians. Uh, he said some pretty hard things <laughs> from time to time. Galatians also, uh, pretty bold. He calls them foolish Galatians at one point, which uh, is something I would not have the courage to say to all of you about you. Uh, whether you needed it or not. So, authority with gentleness. And, and we speak the truth in love. And it's primarily, I mean, you're, it's important that when we speak the word of the Lord or when we are representing the Lord, uh, when we are representing Christ, it's important that we speak in such a way that people can receive and hear the word of the Lord and not our anger or passion or fear or our opinions. What we're wanting them to hear is the word of the Lord because it, God's word changes people. It cuts deeply. It exposes us. It divides, you know, and, and uh, it, it changes our lives. And uh, So we want to speak in such a way that people will receive it. Otherwise, as uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, we're just clanging cymbals. We're just making noise. We don't want to be that. We want, we want it to be significant. And so I want as much as I'm able to, to, to speak God's word, yes, with the authority that it should have, yes, but to balance that out with the gentleness and love that will make it, uh, what is that, a spoonful of sugar? Right? My mother never did that. It was just straight medicine. But that's what Paul is saying to Titus. The emphasis is on uh, speaking the word of the Lord in a way that uh, people will be able to receive it. All right. The highest and purest motivation for Christian behavior is not based on what we can do for God, but upon what God has already done for us and what He will do for us. Our motives are found in what Jesus has already done and what is yet to come. We are not motivated because God has some need in Himself that only we can meet. That's never true, right? So we base our words and we base our actions on what Jesus has already done for us and on the fact that He's going to return for us one day at the end of the age. So, the false teachers on Crete may have assumed that their religious works earned them God's favor, but Paul taught that only as we grasp the full theological significance of God's grace can we eagerly do what is pleasing to God. Paul also reminded the church that they are waiting with hope and that as they attempt as they attempt through God's grace to do what is good, they are waiting with hope and that Jesus Christ will ultimately bring forth his rule of righteousness at the second coming. So we are not working for nothing. When we are advancing God's kingdom on earth, it is not a fruitless, meaningless exercise. Uh, there is a, the day is coming in which God will bring all of that to completion. It will bear fruit. And we are waiting for that day but we are waiting with hope. And in the meantime, we do what is good. We do uh, the word of the Lord. All right.
Final thoughts or questions tonight? Okay. So, uh, just a word of warning. It's a holiday weekend. Go do your shopping tomorrow. And don't wait until this weekend to do that. You've been warned. All right. Let me pray for us. And we'll go. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we pray that you would help us to be aware of your grace, to live in your grace, to fall on your grace, and that your grace would change us to be more like Jesus. And we know that the way we act and speak in this world is to reflect what Jesus has already done for us through his death and resurrection. And it is to be done with a view towards the end of all things when Jesus returns to make all things new. And we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. In the meantime, help us to be waiting with hope and to be doing what you've given to us to do in this present age, to bear witness, to accomplish your purposes, trusting that it matters. It means something. Whether we can see it or not, you are going to be faithful to your word and keep all your promises. So Lord, I pray that you bless these folks here and those who are watching online. May your will be done in their lives. Uh, remind them of how close you are to them and provide for all their needs. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a good week.